All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Dwight Duffy, and I'm going to be providing some commentary on Chapter 1 of the Discovering Computers 2012 book. Great to be here. Uh, welcome aboard, everyone. If you're using um, an earlier edition of the book, um, Discovering Computers 2010 was the last edition of the book that I used. Uh, I can tell you that the content is um, pretty much the same. Uh, it's been polished and um, enhanced in the new book, uh, but you should be able to follow along without any difficulty. Um, <clears throat> this online lecture series is intended to highlight what we think are key points in each chapter. Uh, these lecture notes are not comprehensive in any way. Uh, please note, we are not uh, intending these lecture notes to replace the chapter readings um, at all. Uh, you're probably working along with a chapter worksheet as you, um, as you listen and watch the, uh, the lecture here. You want to make sure that you have the correct worksheet uh, if that's the case. Uh, we're going to be using uh, CAN PowerPoint slides here. Uh, we are not going through all 40 slides. We've uh, selected what we think are the key and most important big ideas in the chapter, and we've pushed those slides up to the top, and we'll go through those. So uh, don't worry if you're peeking over there at the side and see that there's 39 slides. We are not going to be going through every slide. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, the book um, you know covers a, a lot more detail, um, and part of the I think objective of the lecture notes here is to kind of help highlight what the what the more important and big ideas are um, as a supplement to your reading. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. And uh, as we go along, uh, I'm hoping to be able to jump out of PowerPoint and um, onto the web and uh, take a look at some uh, supplemental materials and resources. So technology permitting, uh, we'll be able to do that. So let's go ahead and uh, kind of start uh, where the book starts. And that is uh, this notion that uh, computers are everywhere. That's really a big theme in the book, that computers aren't just the desktop computers that you know people sometimes think of when they think of computers, but the computers are your console, um, game systems, your TVs, um, your, your smartphone, the systems that um, control your automobile and uh, the traffic light down at the corner. The computers are truly everywhere and the word for that is ubiquitous. Ubiquitous means everywhere and it's certainly a good definition for computers. The computers are everywhere and that is kind of one of the themes here in uh, chapter one. It's really a theme throughout the book. The caveat to that is that uh, in a lot of places in the world we have uh, what we refer to as the digital divide. We have the haves and the have-nots. And this not only applies to things like education and money, but also applies to computers and uh, information technology. Um, the differences between access can be pretty stark, right? Uh, particularly when we start looking at it in um, socioeconomic uh, terms. Uh, younger people tend to have more access. Uh, students with more money tend to have more access. Unfortunately, uh, individuals with disabilities statistically um, are less likely to be connected, uh, and that's unfortunate because you know people with disabilities could probably benefit as much, if not more, uh, than um, than anyone else. So. The digital divide is something that um, we need to keep in mind. There are places in the world where even today, one out of 300 people in um, some countries don't have access to uh, information technology of any kind. So, um, and, and definitely when you talk about poverty, people that can't afford access to the internet or have to go to the library um, in order to be able to, to get access to um, technology, that's gonna really limit um, people's uh, ability to benefit from uh, from technology. So the digital divide is is, an, is something that we want to kind of remember when we talk about computers are everywhere. Computers are everywhere but it is very uneven so that would be uh, the caveat that, um, that I think we should put on that. All right so in chapter one we talk about the information processing cycle. 
and this is really an idea that um, that permeates through the book. Uh, when we start talking about these terms that make up the information processing cycle, we'll actually find that there's chapters on input. There's a chapter on input, there's a chapter on processing, there's a chapter on output. Um, so we will elaborate on these ideas in the information processing cycle a lot more as we go uh, through the through the course here. Notice in this slide um, input processing and output are described as the main um, phases in the information processing cycle. We need to add a phase and that is storage and I would put that right under processing in a box under processing um, and I would also put in a box maybe diagonally to the right um, maybe connected with a dotted line that says communication because when we talk about the information processing cycle we almost always need to store data and information uh, you know for for future use and more often than not nowadays the information processing uh, system is going to be connected through some sort of communication or networking um, you're going to be part of a network so if you think of an ATM machine for example um, is it a computer system that that's based on the information processing cycle absolutely um, you know you punch in your pin you slide a card those are both ways data gets put into the system the computer will um, do some authentication there's some communication probably to an external or, or computer somewhere else um, there's storage uh, that's occurring that's um, keeping track of all your transactions and how much uh, money you have left in your account um, there's information being displayed back to you on a screen there's lights that flash to let you know which part of the machine right your money is going to come out of or your cards going to come out of or your receipts going to come out of uh, you have printed output that comes out uh, there's audio output um, so a lot of different things going on um, and it's all part of the information processing cycle so it doesn't matter whether it's a traditional computer or a embedded system all of these computer systems that we're going to be talking about uh, going forward follow this information processing cycle um, data goes in it's transformed um, into a um, useful and organized form and information comes out so data in information out just don't forget there's also storage uh, that makes up the main four uh, phases and then we could add an optional um, you know communication box reason we say optional is if you take something like a calculator is a calculator right an information processing system is there a way to put data into the calculator yes can it calculate or do arithmetic calculations yes can you you know can the calculator remember things yeah maybe um, can the calculator output um, information yeah but is it have a communication or networking feature to it um, you know if it's a sophisticated calculator maybe and maybe it you know can hook up you know with a USB port or something like that but you know a, a typical calculator wouldn't have that so not all systems have every single one of these boxes in every case okay so and then this slide just elaborates on the you know kind of the idea that data is not the same as information and, and that's an important idea that data is input and then it's processed into information and it may be stored along the way uh, it, it, but it's transformed there's some transformative thing that happens in which you know you scan a barcode or you swipe a card in a mag stripe or you punch in a code and things are looked up things are calculated uh, and then things are organized and then you get your bill you know you get your cell phone bill you get your electric bill or you, you get uh, you know some report um, on the computer system these are all examples of uh, information which comes on on some uh, form of output all right so if we understand the information processing cycle which is what we talked about there in the first couple of slides the other big idea is that there's all of this stuff right that makes up a computer system and you can just see all that stuff here on this slide you've got your system unit you've got your webcam and your mouse and your keyboard and your scanner and your printer etc etc the components of a computer system actually mirror the information processing cycle um, so <clears throat> if we look here at this slide uh, the components of a computer exactly 
mirror what we just talked about and that is remember there was an input phase a processing phase an output phase and we said that we needed to have a box for storage and then we also had the optional communication box there is hardware or components right that mirror um, or map to each one of these different um, you know, categories in the information processing cycle. So if you can remember the information processing cycle, you already know the components of a computer as well. So if you can kind of put those kind of two ideas together and then understand that right, a computer is going to have in, in, an input or one or more input devices. And in, in the case of the computer in front of you, that's probably a keyboard. It's probably a mouse. Think of anything else. Maybe a microphone. Right, um, anything like that where data is input. I've got a four-in-one uh, Lexmark printer here, right? So that has a scanning feature on it. I can scan photographs and documents. So that would be an input device. Uh, output devices would be things like your monitor. Uh, it could be a printer. Uh, it could be a projector. It could be, um, you know, speakers. Um, I think uh, most of you probably have a lot of those output devices on the computer that you're working with right now. The system unit maps to what we talked about before which is processing and that's where our uh, random access memory is, that's where our processing unit is, the CPU. And again, remember there's going to be a chapter on each one of these. So there's a chapter on input, a chapter on output, a chapter on processing, a chapter on storage, a chapter on communication and networking. Uh, so there's a lot of detail that can be elaborated from this, but the components themselves, if I go back to the previous slide, I think I can go back to the previous slide, right? We could look at those components and, and identify um, those as, and you can see that they're actually labeled as input devices or output devices or, and the same thing would apply if you were talking about, right, the ATM machine or your cell phone or the digital car alarm system, right, that you have installed in your automobile, right, the car alarm system would have some kind of way of communicating with the system through input, maybe a little, um, a keychain, you know, a little button that you press, and maybe there's an indicator light that flashes different colors, and of course, right, the trigger that triggers the alarm itself is, is a form of output, and the sensors that detect when the glass is broken or when the car is moved or anything like that, those would also be input devices. So it's helpful as we begin to think about computers right being ubiquitous to realize that these ubiquitous computer systems have right I'm looking over across the my office at home here at a D-Link router and I um, am just noticing that right that there's a bunch of indicator lights and they're flashing different um, you know they're flashing different colors and uh, they're flashing at different rates and that's providing some sort of output right from the system I notice there's an antenna sticking out of it and, and that's telling me that you know that there's some communication occurring right um, and you know I look at my printer and my printer now has a USB port in the front so I can actually hook up a storage device to my printer and there's a touch screen on my printer very cool I can actually scan and turn documents into PDF files without even hooking it up to my computer my printer is a computer right it's a computer in itself so um, the lines get kind of blurred here uh, between you know one device and the next device where ind independent devices now become we were taking apart our ceiling fan and discovered um, that there's a computer board in it right that's you know there's a remote control and um, of course this is great until your ceiling fan or your washing machine breaks and then you realize that there's actually a computer there and that you need a computer repairman and you're gonna have to replace this two hundred dollar board um, you know when that fails same thing with your car, right? All of these electronic uh, systems in the car. All right. So components of a computer. Well, let's move on. Um, advantages and disadvantages of using computers. You know, this whole idea of kind of weighing cost and benefit, pros and cons is something we do with everything. Computers is no exception. Obviously, computers are good at doing things uh, rapidly. Uh, there's a... Uh, a sense in which reliability is enhanced, hopefully, consistency. You know, computers are great at storage, storing large amounts of uh, data and information, and then they're uh, very um, good at communicating, um, you know, through through a network or other communication uh, mode. 
the disadvantage size, and these are the usual suspects, you know, health risks and privacy and public safety. Um, but the disadvantages of using computers, I think, are a lot more, um, you know, a lot greater than the book um, portends here. The, um, you know, the whole social aspect of computers, especially in the last few years with computer addiction, um, I was driving my kids to school today and I saw three or four people texting while they were driving on the freeway at 70 miles an hour. I mean, yeah, this is a health risk, but I mean, you know, scary stuff. Um, loss of cultural identity, uh, you know, where groups of people, indigenous populations, right, are suddenly finding that, um, you know, it's very difficult, you know, to kind of maintain the values and, um, uh, and norms that were there before. Uh, you look at something like what's going on in, in in the Middle East with the Arab Spring, you know, and you see all of this information technology that's great. It's helping, uh, you know, organize um, the protests. Um, and yet you see a rapper in L.A. Um, just here this last week that sent out a tweet uh, to his, um, you know, 20,000 um, or 40,000 or whatever uh, followers saying call this phone number if you want a music internship and they had tens of thousands of calls in and it, the number he gave out was the sheriff department and he thought that that was funny and um, it basically brought you know all of the phone and communication networks down they couldn't handle the volume of calls just with one person sending out a tweet so a lot of interesting uh, socio um, cultural issues um, tied up here when we talk about things like the digital divide, we talk about network neutrality, we talk about intellectual property and privacy. So, um, you know, we want to, we don't want to understate the disadvantages of, of using computers and yet we know that, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. We can't put it back in unless you want to go live in a cave. All right, uh, uh, obviously a huge theme in the book is networks and the internet. So chapter one kind of talks about that and introduces that idea. And we'll be coming back to that. Um, chapter two, in fact, is all about the internet, you know, the, the worldwide collection of, of, of computers that we're all part of, that I can access with my cell phone, um, you know, my printer has an IP address, my set-top box. Uh, for television uh, might have an IP address and be on the internet. So that's, a, that's obviously a huge, huge um, big idea uh, in modern uh, computer systems. And again, the book really kind of wants to give this idea of all of the ways that um, people use computers, the breadth of use and the breadth of users. And I think we all understand that, right? I mean, the way we use computers today is different than the way we use computers, you know, six months ago or a year ago. You know, with a tablet computer now, suddenly, you know, we can watch movies, you know, on a handheld device in a meaningful way. Uh, this is something that, you know, people weren't doing a couple of years ago uh, because there were no tablet computers. So I don't think we need to elaborate on all these different uses. We just need to realize, right, the, the breadth of, of use and users. Components of computer that we talked about earlier speaks to the hardware. Uh, of course, what makes computers actually work and what gives computers um, kind of a soul is the software, the programs that tell a computer what to do. And software is divided into these two big categories, system software like your operating system, whether it's your Mac OS or your Windows 7 or even if it's a console, you know, like an Xbox or a Sony, it has an operating system. By the way, that operating system in Sony's case got hacked and, um, you know, there was, a, a, you know, huge uh, repercussions to, to the company. Um, we're always, you know, fighting viruses and spyware and adware and, and Trojans and uh, we're worrying about those sorts of things, right? The system software is important um, and yet we need utilities to protect us and to do all these different things that uh, maybe we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And of course application software is the, and there's a whole chapter on that, um, <clears throat> that lets us do all the different things that we do with a computer. 
Okay, categories of computers. Um, again, kind of a big picture idea, this notion that computers can be uh, kind of put into kind of boxes uh, by looking at them and say this computer system is a personal computer, this system is a server, this system is a supercomputer. Uh, I think that that's useful and valuable. I think we don't need to elaborate that too much uh, further, but I do want to talk about a few of these categories uh, a bit further. Personal computers, I think we know what those are. It could be a laptop, it could be a desktop, it could be a tower. Um, it has the keyboard, the mouse, the monitor. Mobile computers and mobile devices, again, it kind of blurs with personal computers, but smartphones, tablet computers, um, e-readers, all these sorts of things that are intended to be available on the go. So that's a category of computer. The game consoles, of course, refers to Xbox and Sony, uh, the Wii, and I might have an argument with giving it its own category, but how many of you actually have a game console? Probably a lot of you. Can you access the internet with that game console? Uh, can you um, watch movies with that game console? Can you access Netflix? Probably. So um, game consoles is a pretty important category uh, in, in today's um, uh, technology space. Servers. Um, talk a little bit about servers. Servers has become such an important part of uh, modern um, computer infrastructure. Servers are what provide, you know, these huge, these server farms are what provide, um, you know, these huge um, social networks like Facebook or the search engines like Google um, or iTunes, you know, Music Store or um, you know, even, you know, things like Blackboard and Eagle Advisor that students, you know, taking college classes use. It's all based on servers. In, in the photo here, you've got multiple computers kind of in a rack setting, and you this rack can have, in this case, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, sixteen, right? Um, sixteen different, you know, kind of sub servers or, or computer systems, probably with multi core processors. Um, notice that, you know, you have multiple servers in a typical installation and we're not just talking about you know wall size or rack size I think we're talking about um, if I can skip out of here for a second uh, one of my favorite bloggers is Robert Scoble and he um, you know he did something on um, a photo tour let's see if we can find this uh, Facebook data center you might want to check this out. It'll probably be the top link here. Robert Scoble, he's kind of a commentator on you know all things technology, and he had um, gone to this uh, tour of Facebook's new data center in Oregon, the size of three. So I can scroll through this th of three WalMarts. I mean, this is just. Um, you know, kind of stunning in terms of uh, of size. Uh, three WalMarts. We see these big, clean, um, you know, filter um, rooms where the air is filtered out. These giant fans. These are the filters. Here are the fans. Um, the, here's the the water systems that that will provide mist in the air to take the dust out. Um, and then just the, you know, just the thousands and thousands, the tens and hundreds of thousands of rack mount servers, right, that are providing, right, you know, access to millions of simultaneous users. There's some um, 180 degree uh, views that you can look at. Uh, I encourage you to kind of take a look at that. When we talk about servers, sure, we might have a server at the college or you might have a server, you know, um, in your office at work that's providing internet access or print access, but the big servers, right, that we're thinking about in terms of what's really changing out here are these giant server farms. All right, uh, we talked about servers, mainframes. Mainframes have been around since, you know, the first digital computer in 1945. You know, the ENIAC was this big giant monstrosity of a, of a, 
of a computer and uh, mainframes have always been kind of the, the big computers. Uh, there were just a handful of companies and there still are just a few companies that really make the big mainframe computers. But servers have really um, kind of eclipsed um, the traditional mainframe computers and a whole category of computers which we refer to as mini computers or mid-range computer systems have sort of kind of disappeared um, out of the out of the terminology um, because of the you know the ascendance of you know the the more traditional uh, server and server farms uh, going down the list uh, supercomputers love supercomputers supercomputers are mainframe computers that are just you know massively parallel um, in their processing and um, are the fastest uh, computers on the planet um, just for a little flavor of this one of the website I like uh, to look at is top 500.org and the top 500 refers to the top 500 fastest supercomputers um, on the planet and they it's changing so fast that um, you know a couple of years ago the United States had 8 out of 10 uh, back in 2004 Japan was number one and then the United States reclaimed it and now we're in 2011 and Japan has reclaimed the top ranked fastest supercomputer in the in the world uh, so you can go in and look at these lists. June 2011 is the most recent list, and then they'll do it, another list in probably November uh, of this year. And of course, the big news is, is J J Japanese ascendancy. But this is really interesting to actually look at. Uh, Japan's number one. China's number two now. United States at Oak Ridge is number three and then China and then Japan and the United States, United States, United States, France and then the United States. So right now five out of ten fastest computers uh, or computer kind of cluster networks are in the United States uh, but you can really see the ascendancy of, of Asia um, China and Japan in uh, these ranks. If we actually click on one of these I'm going to do the number three Oak Ridge get a little bit more information um, on that system or if we look at the full list we get the complete list here, not just the top 10. The thing to notice about this, if, if we actually look at the, if we look at the list, where is the top 10? Where is the top 500? Here it is. The thing to notice here uh, at, uh, on these ranked computers is the number of processors that they have and you can see that by looking at the number of cores that the computer has you might have a you know dual core or quad core um, a lot of these are using traditional you know very standard not anything special processors but there's just a lot of them in the case of Japan they've managed to knit together over a half million of these things 400 or 548,000 cores or processors and that's what provides them right the supercomputing power um, you can just see that they just have so many more processors and that's why just through brute force they're able to actually have right these um, you know these uh, powerful um, benchmark um, performance alright so supercomputers are interesting supercomputers are often used for simulations there you'll see a lot of that in nuclear you know weather simulation um, not so much you know multiple users you don't see Facebook using supercomputers um, as much as you would you know as a scientific or maybe a government um, uh, agency although certainly you know in finance and that sort of thing uh, there's a fair amount of work going on in terms of modeling and that sort of thing in economics and, and, and things like that and also a lot of theoretical stuff finding prime numbers and stuff like that all right and then we finish up the list uh, at the bottom with what is actually probably the most um, plentiful or, or the, you know the most quantity of, of categories of computers is the embedded computers. Those are the computers that we talked about earlier that are everywhere. The computer that's in your car, the computer that controls the analog brakes, the, another computer controls the supplemental restraint airbag system another computer probably is controlling the fuel injection these embedded systems are everywhere right they control our phone networks they control the military guidance systems and warning systems the ATM machine um, the traffic light control system 
you name it, there's embedded systems that do that. You know, if you go to Best Buy or Fry's Electronics, right, just about everything there is an embedded computer system, right? Whether it's your set-top box or your high-definition TV, like I mentioned earlier, my printer is uh, made up of, you know, uh, as a computer. It's, a, it's an embedded um, computer system. It has all of the, you know, features that we would expect to see in a computer. All right, and um, so you know that's that's that idea that you know that there's a, a breadth of embedded systems out there, and we're almost done here. We got um, one more slide. The last big idea from chapter one, and I think this is an important one, is this um, notion of elements of an information system. Part of the the trick here in chapter one is just getting a handle on the terminology, right? We talk about the information processing cycle. Remember that was input, processing, output, storage. And then we have categories of information, right? Uh, systems, categories of computers like personal computers and supercomputers and mainframe computers. And then we have components of computers. Uh, and here we have elements of an information system. Hardware, uh, software, data, people, procedures. Of course, we talked about hardware and we talked about software, and we understand that data gets put into the system and gets stored. But there's also, when we talk about an information system, right, there are the people that are involved in making the systems, programming the systems. There's people that are um, tasked with, um, you know, supporting and maintaining the systems. There's people that use the systems. And um, all of these things, right, kind of have to be in place. Procedures, backup procedures, privacy procedures. I'm just going to give you one example of how important it is to have procedures. We all know that medical records are, right, supposed to be secure and are supposed to be private, right? We have federal law and HIPAA, everything else, right, that protects your privacy. But unless you have procedures in place, even though the data may be encrypted, right, if people have access, right, that data can get out, right, even though you have the best hardware, the best software, right, um, and even good people, right, what would otherwise would be good people if you don't have good procedures in place uh, can run can run afoul. Um, you guys remember Britney Spears had some psychiatric mental uh, problem. Um, I'm going to type in here Brittany, Brittany Spears medical records, and I bet you that that search will, will probably reveal here um, hospital to punish snooping. This happened a few years ago, right? What is a big story? UCLA Medical Center is taking steps to fire 13 employees and suspended at least six others for snooping in the confidential right medical records of Britney Spears. Right? Those records were supposed to be confidential, but when it's a celebrity. People want to know, right? And even doctors, right, have been actually um, um, facing discipline for peaking. Um, you know, they want to know. They want to tell their, you know, the, their family and their friends. And and um, same thing happened with Michael Jackson, right, where you know information was getting leaked out that shouldn't have, um, you know, before it should have. Anytime there's a criminal case, it seems like right data is is going out. So that's one example of how important it is to have procedures in place. Uh, it's not enough to just say, you know, you know, to have a law that protects it, but you actually have to have some procedures uh, in place to actually, you know, implement whatever the system is. So that's um, kind of the, the, the final big idea in uh, chapter one. Um, so good overview of, you know, the whole field of, of computers and um, you know with kind of a focus on you know on the on the kind of the way we uh, frame and um, conceptualize information systems the information processing cycle uh, critically important and the um, you know up at the top the very beginning and um, then the components of a computer system which mirror that the um, the, ca uh, the categories of, uh, of computer systems and kind of then finishing up with the um, elements of an information system. All right, so that concludes um, this uh, lecture on chapter one.